read me romance read read me romance read me romance read read me romance you could take a look in a book that's fine or you could sit back relax and unwind and read me romance read read me romance welcome back lady listeners hey lady listeners we have a brand new book from Myra Statham this week. It's called Hard Pass, and we're super excited about it. Mel especially, because she's been binging Myra for the I past have, two weeks. I have, because yeah. so that football book came out, and I was like, oh, I'm just going to read this, because the series was called Obsessed Alphas. What more do you need to be told? And That's the wording it. was like, stalker, <laughs> stalker, stalker. So I devoured that one, and then I got a mm-hmm. teaser for the next one, for the, mm-hmm. the next chapter, and immediately... He's stalking the girl. I'm like, this is great. I'm here for it. (laughs) That's awesome. Um, She is so incredibly nice over emails when I talk to her. She is so sweet. She's so sweet that Leah screenshots them and sends them. I know. I'm like, look how nice she is. (laughs) But I did the football books and then I was scrolling through her books because she has so many. She actually has a lot. So I was like, Just kind of scrolling through and clicking through. And I randomly came across an older one. Let me see when this one came out, actually. 2017. Nice. So what caught my uh, attention, it was called Something Worth Saving. And what is very rare is a Oh, is it a marriage? Book. Yes. So, oh, man, that's tough. It was very well done. Oh, Yeah. It was, was very it? well okay. done. Because, Alexa like, Raleigh approved then? Yeah, it was very, just like they got wrapped up in their lives. You uh-huh. know, he's a yeah, doctor yeah. and, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. kind of small spoilers. Like, she thinks that maybe he's doing something with reception at work when really yeah. he's just, yeah. um, he loves his wife. Like, he is so, like, into work and cre- uh-huh. treating everybody as equals. Yeah, that that never even registered on his mind that this woman was being flirtatious or yeah, staying okay. late with him. Yeah. Like it was, it didn't even like clock uh-huh. to him yeah. until another doctor was like, you know, that receptionist is saying shit, and he's like, what? Oh my gosh! And then scandalous. So, but you see, he does. He says like, what I found so relatable, and it made me think was sometimes in your marriage, I think you say things. And you don't realize how they come off. Yeah. Like there was a moment and it made me think Mm -hmm. where he was like, oh, we don't need to be eating that. She's like, oh, I'm just going to grab fast food. He's like, oh, we Uh, don't need to be eating that. But he's a doctor. Yeah. Yeah. He's like, Mm -hmm. he's like, oh, we don't need to be eating that junk. And yes. so she takes it like, I'm fat. Yeah, I'm fat. <laughs> that's yeah. how I would take it. Yeah. That's exactly he, how I would take he's it. He's just meaning, oh, he hates we, need to be, we need to be helpful. In fact, she thinks about going and getting plastic surgery. He gets like upset about it, <gasps> but he's a plastic surgeon. Oh, okay. Yeah. But he does a lot of reconstruction. Okay. Like okay. sometimes he has to get called out for emergencies, like car mm-hmm. wrecks. Yeah, okay. And reconstructing people's mm-hmm. faces. And he's just Oh, he's really- like Mink Steamy on Grey's Anatomy. <laughs> yeah. But he loves her. And oh, they've just kind that. of gotten lost. Mm-hmm. And then they have two adorable girls. And the girls give the dad a little bit of hell. I love and it. And it's just really sweet. Like, I enjoyed it. I was never, like, mad. It was very relatable in a very sweet way. I yeah. was like, okay, this is, like, one of the ones... That really hit on some subjects, but in a really sweet, endearing way that didn't like upset me. Wow. So what was the name of this one again? It Save. was called Something Worth Saving. That's a perfect title, too. So it was really Not cute. Not like, them. You were doing it. So I was like, okay, I like I like this. Yeah. So they met in like college sweetheart or high school sweetheart's first year. He was like enamored with her. Mm-hmm. But it's like I said, it's just really... I enjoyed it a lot. It was very well done marriage book, yeah. which is really hard to find. That is hard to find, especially if, like it's it's hard to fucking like write. It. Yeah, it is because you don't want. I mean, especially if you write it without cheating. Mm-hmm. Like, okay, well, what's the conflict? How do you create a conflict that you know that they can work through in the book, but yeah. still like you know, I, I don't know, They'll, like be able to make it through something like that, you know, that it's not a detriment to the marriage, that it's not falling apart. It's just like, I like that aspect of it where 
they're just too busy and they get caught up or like the ones we've done where they're just too obsessed and they think that their partner will they're hate They're hiding it. their obsession. Yeah. Yeah. They're like, if this bitch finds out how crazy I am, she's going to be out of here. She won't love me anymore. <laughs> Meanwhile, she's like, please. <laughs> um, I finished up um, a book the other day. Did you finish it, that 36 hour book? No, no, oh, okay. that won't take me a while. I, I actually looked at. I only have like twenty one left, and I like got a little panicky, and I was like, maybe I should slow down. <laughs> but no, this one was um, Robert Dugani wrote a book, and I've, I know I've talked about it before because this is the ninth book in the series, and it's the Tracy Crosswright series. And and you know the first book is fantastic. Even the first couple of books are fantastic, and I love them. But I don't know if I've just been with this series so long or I've changed as I've read this series and the series has stayed the same, you know, because what? I understand what you're saying because I was actually talking about this with another lady listener that I messaged with on Facebook. Yeah. I'll remember loving a book Uh and going back and reading it and been like, how the fuck did I like this book? Yeah. Yeah. This man is an asshole. <laughs> yeah. It's weird. With, with the way that, you know, the series has progressed, I get more annoyed with men who write women leads. You know, like that, the because it's not a romance, but there there's a romantic aspect, I guess. She's married and she's like has scenes with her husband and stuff, but she's a detective and she solves crimes. And th- I love that. Th- those are my good palate cleanser between romances. You know, I just mm-hmm. deep dive into Angelina Lopez and then I had my awesome Ali Martinez book. And I was like, you know, what? I'm going to have a mystery in between. And so I started this one and I was like halfway through and I was like, I don't think I'm going to read any more of these. You know, and it is the ninth book in the series, although the story was great. I didn't necessarily have any problems with that. It was just like every time the, you know, the author would describe someone, I would just consider, well, what's he, you know, why is he describing this? Why is he saying, and it wasn't even overt, like her tits were big or, you know, what it wasn't anything like that. It was just these little tiny hints of it. It's like, oh, she was, you know, she was aggressive or she was, you know, this kind of thing where it was like, I wouldn't have minded it if a woman had written these words. But the the more I read, the more it kind of annoyed me. And I was like, maybe I've just changed to where I don't like women written from the male gaze anymore. I I mean... (laughs) Not to get off topic. It's just a get very, off topic. Get off the fucking topic, Mel. It's just a very, <laughs> it's a very overwhelming time right now, and I think there yeah. is a lot of yeah. anger towards men at the moment, mm-hmm. and it's just yeah. there. And anytime one even comes off the cuff with something, mm-hmm. it's like you're like, wham, back the fuck yeah. up. Yeah. It's just like a knee jerk reaction, especially with everything that happened over the weekend following that case of the runner that was abducted and Mm -hmm. just like. I'm just so sick of men describing women to me and telling me what women should and shouldn't be. And I'm, and maybe I'm just so extra sensitive to it now. So I'm in that group where this runners, I got way too invested in this story. And I think it's because (laughs) it really caught my attention because I have run mm-hmm. at four o'clock. I remember when I first started running, yeah. I'd wake up really early before yeah. I got the kids off to school and I uh-huh. would run my country road yeah. at like four and five in the morning when the mm-hmm. sun would be very, sometimes it'd still be a little dark. Yeah. So when I seen that story, it really like caught my attention. Of course. I'm sure so you identified so, with that a lot. I was like, holy shit. Mm-hmm. And it was just just going down that rabbit hole. But then I got in the group because I wanted updates of what was going on. I knew she was gone, Mm -hmm. you know, but I wanted to see how it was progressing out. And some of these men were in this group and their comments were stuff like, she shouldn't, why was she running at 4 30 in the morning? Yep. I've seen it. Uh Uh-huh. Why wasn't she this? Why Mm -hmm. wasn't she that? And she should have known better, blah, blah, blah. Like, and I told Rob, I was like, oh, this is so frustrating. So I just feel like, why aren't people angrier? Mm-hmm. Why aren't we angrier? Because we're conditioned to just de- to deal with it. 
because we've done it for so long and nobody's pointed out that it's a problem. And now people are starting to point out it's a problem and we're seeing it everywhere. I would love to know if lady listeners out there, when was the last time I went a whole podcast without saying I hate men? Because I can't remember the last time that happened. I know. <laughs> like, I, I said it like a lot over time. the weekend. And it sucks because <laughs> I have I have a great dad, a great husband. Yes, me too. Yeah. But even me I'm too. talking to Rob and I was like, I hate men. And, yeah. he's, like, and yeah. he's like, I understand. I said, you know what? Yeah. I know that you're born gay. Mm-hmm in your sexual preferences, because if I could choose, I would not be with a man. No fucking way. I would way. not pick There's it. He no was fucking like, way. He was like, I 100% agree. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally wouldn't be with us that. either. <laughs> I literally said to my husband while I was cooking dinner earlier, he was in the kitchen. We were, you know, he was helping me like we were cooking together. And I was standing there and he was like, we were talking about they're hiring somebody new for the city. He was like, oh, you know, it's just another white man that they're going to hire. And I was like, God, I hate white men. He was like, me too. And I was like, I know what you mean when you say that, but it's funny to hear you say that. It is. That's interesting you said that because we're getting new neighbors. And I told Rob, I was like, I really hope it's diversity. I know, right? I really hope. Mm-hmm. Like, I'm like waiting to see who moves in next door. I'm like, yep. oh, give me something. Listen, last week at fencing, I was sitting there. And, you know, I, I feel I, I will openly admit, I think fencing is a rich white people sport. But I was pleasantly surprised at the diversity when we went to the nationals and we saw everyone that there. There was actually a huge Asian community that does this, which I thought was awesome. Mm -hmm. But last week at fencing, our times have changed. So Lydia switched classes. So she doesn't go on Thursday. She goes on Wednesdays now, whatever. So this was like the first time since summer was over that we've been going regularly on Wednesdays. And we kind of hung back a little bit because she was doing some drills and was running a little late. And there were the second group that was after us, it's the girls that are a year older come in. And there was this black mom with two young black girls that were fencing. And I immediately like got up and I was like, hey, you guys, fence? because I was just like, I, I just thought like, I, I've never seen any black people in our group, like in our, you know, like, I don't want to say store, but like in our, you know, little, our, the fencing place that, that we go to. And I was immediately like, oh my gosh, I should make friends. Like I should that, like I make was, sure that that's welcoming. I was going to ask you that when you just started to say that, because sometimes I'll see some in our community at school stuff. And I'm like, is it weird that I like want to go sit next to them? Is that being pushy? Is that not okay? Or is it I something know. I should do? I'm sure everybody has their own situation. You know, like some people might appreciate it. Some people might not. Yeah, I don't, I, and there's no one answer for that. But I just know like, you know, and again, we were transitioning to the next class after us. So I got up so she could have my seat. So like I got up and went over to her. I was like, hey, how's it going? I was like, I haven't seen you guys here before, but we're about to leave if you want our chairs. Don't sit that one on the end that's broken. And then we started joking. And her daughter came up to me and she saw my Harry Potter necklace. And she was like, what's your house? And I was like, I'm a Slytherin. And she was like, I'm a Ravenclaw. And I was like, now we got a duel. (laughs) And she was so nice. But anyways, it's like, it's one of those things where I thought like, what does it hurt to go out of my way to be to be nice, especially to see people of color a, in this, that situation? I live in such a small town. It's like a sea of. We were literally pulling out of the tennis court because we've been playing tennis, mm-hmm. and I'm pulling out, and the football team is walking around, and I'm mm-hmm. t- in the car with Isabel. I'm like, it's a sea of just white men with blonde hair oh, for the football team. <laughs> oh my god. It's like, this is terrible. Uh, You know, it just, I think it's one of those things like, what can it hurt to be, you know, friendly, especially to people who, you know, think about a person of color being in your situation Mm -hmm. that's going there to play tennis and they don't see one other black person there or, you know, Latinx or anything like that, you know, some that someone doesn't identify with anything like that, you know, and like I said, our group that's in, fencing isn't super diverse. I mean, I see, you know, a couple of, you know, a little bit of diversity, but obviously not a lot. So I was just really excited when there was, you know, another family that came in and I was like, oh, wow, this is great. Like, you know, maybe if we're really welcoming, like there can be more people from the community that come and do this too. So 
So yeah. that's all. I don't know. I just never want to overstep, but I also want to be like very like mm -hmm. welcoming, like, hey, you're listen. You know what I mean? One time I did this and it was it was amazing. It was the best day ever. So I had volunteered to do lunchroom duty. Um, when Lydia was in elementary school, I did it a couple of times, but like basically the moms just go in the cafeteria and help give the teachers yeah. a break. It's in like, elementary school, I think we yeah, did it a few times. Yeah. So it's like you go in and you give their teacher can go have an hour break and you just kind of watch the classroom eat and make sure they don't choke to death. And so this was like, this, this was before 2020, I guess, because this was like before mass and everything. But, um, so we're in the thing, you know, in the cafeteria and I didn't know any of the other moms and there was like two or three black ladies that were standing together and like talking and stuff. And I just walked over cause you know, they were the moms that were there. And then I was like, yeah, Hey, how's it going? They were really nice. They were like, Hey, how are you? You know, just kind of small talk. And then we see this other mom, this white lady, who's like a Karen who is going up and down the aisles and telling the kids what to do. Like put your cups on red. Y'all are on red. No talking all on red today and one of the ladies looks over and she was like oh shit miss boss is here <laughs> i'm done she called her miss boss the whole time and i was like i've come to the right side <laughs> <laughs> those ladies we talked so much shit it was amazing i love it I was like yeah I, I definitely chose the right side of the cafeteria that day <laughs> miss boss i can still picture that woman in my head like yelling at those kids but anyways um so yeah so i watched um i also wanted to update too i watched the new um 365 there was part three oh, that okay. came out a couple weeks ago so and, and how I guess was it like, so that i guess they released part two and then they released part three like two or three weeks later it was they're pretty close i actually like the third part better than the second one okay but i fast forwarded through most of the sex because there is so it can get much redundant. of it yes and it was kind of like, you know, it was sort of a little repetitive. Like, okay, because they're, they're I think, still fucking. I think the problem with a lot of sex in a movie is, mm -hmm. and the difference between in a book, mm -hmm. in a book, you're getting inner monologue. Yeah, you see it differently. too. Oh, yeah, and you hear what they think. You're yeah. hearing mm -hmm. the dirty thoughts and how he's seeing her. And he's mm -hmm. like, oh, I love this. And mm -hmm. they can't get enough of her, which they can't vocalize all of that. But you yeah, can have paragraphs yeah. and paragraphs of those uh -huh. inner thoughts, which are very like, oh, I'll eat this up. Yeah, yeah. But I can see that too, because like in a movie, it's like almost being alluded to is ha the tease is half the fun you yeah. know in a movie visually i think but um there was this one scene and then a little spoiler if you haven't watched it um she's having a dream where the two guys are like kissing each other on top of her and like mm. there's a threesome but she's watching the two guys go at it and they actually kiss like on screen and I paused that and rewound it. And I watched that again. <laughs> so th I didn't think that would be hot. And it was so hot. You know, as I've gotten older, I've been in more to the male, male, female. Mm -hmm. I used yeah. to just want the male, female, male. Okay, yeah. But there's something about, I think it's that deep connected friendship mm -hmm. that the males yeah. have. And then, then you're at kind of the center of it. Mm -hmm. But the friendship is so deep that those lines don't matter. It's like you guys are all really in this relationship together. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That it makes it, I don't know. It makes it seem more special to me. No, I get that. I like that too. Yeah. No, I totally understand that. So the plot was a lot better. I thought it was really good. It was still a cliffhanger and there's going to be a four. I don't know if there's going to be more beyond that or not. I really hope they don't keep stretching this out. So yeah. I don't know. I do think like, even when I read a book, I think about three sex scenes that are full out detailed is probably about the max I'll read without kind of skimming a little bit, yeah. unless it's like something really, it's like some kind of acrobatic feat that's happening. And I'm like, how did they do that? <laughs> you know, sometimes you'll come up on something new or that's not mm -hmm. often. You're like, oh, he's oh, fascinating. We I don't get read that, that often. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Okay, so I'll go ahead and read this one. Oh, no. I'm telling you, right? Woo, I know. Um, let's you know talk what? about. Oh, do what? Gonna no, no, go I ahead. was going to say, I've been watching um, 
I think I talked to you about it for a second, maybe. For, I'm not usually into the crime documentary shows, YouTube oh, yeah. podcasts. Uh-huh. Yes. I've been watching Adventures with Purpose on YouTube. Uh-huh. I've never watched anything on YouTube. I've never heard life. that. I've never heard of it. When you were telling me, I was like, I don't know what that is. They like, it is so fascinating. But what's so fascinating about it, even though these men are married, so I have to be. These men go out and they solve cold cases but you know where they came from so they only search for people who went missing with vehicles okay so if you went missing and your vehicle is missing and Uh nobody can find it that's Mm -hmm. what they specialize in and this main guy Uh, like vehicle forensics or something well he Mm -hmm. says there's only three places a vehicle is going to be it's going to be in water Mm mm-hmm it's going to be smashed down, which is usually very easily trackable, uh, mm-hmm. trackable mm-hmm. or it's going to be buried. Not easy. Yeah. So he's like, usually it's in water and that's what they do. They do solar things. But these guys is actually one of the main guys. The reason he got into this is because he's like the best tow truck driver in the world. What? That's yeah. weird. <laughs> So he like, and you'll see him do it. You guys can subscribe to it on YouTube. Mm-hmm. Adventures of Purpose. They've solved like 26 cases in the last two years. Holy shit. So they solved that missing 16 year old girl. Okay. Did you hear about her? No. Uh-uh, missing no. from the party. She's been missing for two weeks and they oh, wow. scorched all these lakes or whatever. Uh-huh. And they get there. Adventures of Purpose gets there and they're like, we usually don't do cases this fresh, but we'll look. Uh-huh. So they usually solve like 30 year old cases and stuff. Yeah. So they get there and they're like, well, we really, they had this party on this dock area, like right uh-huh. there. And they're like, we really searched this lake, but there's like three other lakes around. I think it's in Utah and the lakes are gorgeous. So uh-huh. they go out and they search all these three other lakes. They don't see nothing. Okay. And then they're like, we're going to search this lake because no lake is searched unless we searched it. Uh-huh. These motherfuckers drop in the water. Bam Uh -uh. uh-uh like found it like that i mean like instantly like i can't believe the cops didn't find this car holy shit how like right there it was but it's just interesting to show because they get into it with the cops a lot Mm -hmm. like the cops get (laughs) mad because they're looking like one quick one was a guy went off of a ice like a bridge he Mm -hmm. went off and they know he went off and they can't find the car. So they get out there. They're looking for it. The cops get mad because they get out there on the river. And they're like, get out of here. We're This is our crime scene. So they mm-hmm. pull off to the side. The cops are looking around. Can't find it. They go to lunch. They come back over. They find the car in two seconds. Oh, my they, God. They Stop. buoy the car. So they drop what they call buoys. They do these magnets. Uh-huh. They get them to six of the sides of the car. Yeah. And the cops show back up. And they're like, get your magnet off. We're doing this. So he pulls his magnet off and they go back over, which they could see where they were. The divers yeah. get in. They can't find this fucking car. Are you, <laughs> it's like a car. How do they not find it? Well, it can be hard with some of the, sometimes they're like, that's a car. See the wheel. And I can't see it. Oh, okay. But the cops are like, can you come back over and put your buoy on? <laughs> and shut up. I mean, some oh of the cops God. are really nice, but a few of them, the cops have gotten fired mm-hmm. after these guys have been there and oh, them shit. being really rude. Yeah. And these guys are nice to them. Mm-hmm. They're like, all right, we're sorry. We'll move out of your way. If you need your, if you need our help, we'll mm-hmm. do it. But what's interesting is the main guy, he's rough. He's got a beard, the tow truck guy. Yeah. He is good looking. And he's like, <laughs> Like oh, that's at, a dangerous combo. And Shit. so like they're, but he's just like so smart. Like he's sitting there, he's going down the river. They're looking for a woman who went missing with her kid mm-hmm. in her car, like 20 years ago. And they're going down this river. And he's like, because he's such a truck truck drive driver, mm-hmm. he's like going down and he's like, look at that guardrail. And you kind of it pans over and he goes, That guardrail is only 10 years old. Look at the the bolts around it and how it's rusted. So if that guardrail wasn't there, what would somebody project it off of there? And he literally mathematically does it. 
Oh my like God. he like one time they get down and one they're trying to find this kid's car he gets mm-hmm. down there they're talking to the mom and he's like if this car went off here because it's this kind of car it's going to float mm-hmm. for two to eight minutes it's going to go 40 yards out and it's going to sink oh wow like okay so they start setting up and he goes out and the mom like turns around and she's like what's that and the guy turns around and he's like he found it it was literally five minutes and this oh car was missing God. for like four years Holy shit. That's how like So what does he do? Like so the car though, is it like he's finding the people too? Yes, he's finding the people. Oh, no. So sometimes when you're actually in like he's searching for someone, mm-hmm. they'll find other vehicles. Mm-hmm. And sometimes he'll if the windows aren't open, mm-hmm. he can't clear them. So he has to call the cops. He's like, okay. This could be a crime scene. Do you want yeah. it? we'll pull it out of the lake for you if you want, but yeah. you have to open it. You yeah. can't open it. But sometimes he'll clear that if the windows are open, he'll clear mm-hmm. and he'll say there's no body. Yeah. And then just alert them so they Does know. Does he dive down that. in there or just like run a camera? He dives down. There's no way I would dive in a water looking for that. At mm-hmm. one time he's down there, he's like, there's a baby crocodile down here. I'm like, oh shut the God. fuck up. No. Okay. I'm immediately over. out. I'm going to have to watch this. Though. This sounds really cool. He, the, it just sounds, it's very fascinating to watch them. And it's not even just about, I mean, I get excited when they find the cars of the mm-hmm. people they're looking for. They mm-hmm. don't always find them, but they find a lot of them. Just their process is interesting. Mm-hmm. Just listening to him talk. And I'm like, this. I don't know why I find it so hot. Have you ever no, seen I the, do. I like that. Have you ever seen the show Ice Truckers? It was on years yeah. ago. Oh, yeah. I used to love that I show. How do you have that feeling to it? Ooh, where they're kind of okay, like badass yeah. doing this heavy lifting. Like mm-hmm. the cops show up. They don't know how to pull this out. And he's like, do you want me to pull it out? Do you want me to get a crane? Do you want me to get a <laughs> and he can like, he can do it. <laughs> That's he's amazing. like, He's like, the car is going to lift like this. It's going to flip this way. So I need you to turn this. I'm like, I don't even understand what you're saying this is hot <laughs> <laughs> you're just so smart yeah i'm definitely gonna have to check that out now immediately after we're finished but, inter- <laughs> but here's the great thing Hall. i will say this i'll link it in the show notes but mm-hmm. it does cost 12 dollars a month to subscribe to their stuff but oh, they have okay. tiers it goes from 12 dollars all the way up to 150 all the tiers are the same okay it's just a matter of what you want to support oh okay because okay. they do not charge anything Oh, wow. Okay. So when they offer to pool the vehicles for the families, the police departments, uh-uh. all the stuff they no way. do it all for free. So okay. that's how they These make men their money. Can stay. These men can stay. I like so that's stuff. how the YouTube and the subscribing, the yeah. $12 mm-hmm. a month is how they pay to be able to do this full time. They're constantly traveling that. across the United States. Now, are they States. on YouTube TV or just like, I guess, regular YouTube? I don't know. It's just I, don't know. Looks at, I watched it up on my phone, but after they okay. found that missing teenage girl and mm-hmm. they found her so quickly, yeah, I have a feeling that the YouTube thing's going to come to an end. Yeah, and they're going to go and like Netflix or something. You somebody's think? going to pick them up. That sounds like a Discovery Channel show. Yeah. Or something, the, you know, A and E or something. Yeah, exactly. I don't know. Yeah, the somebody's, history, something like that. When I got done watching, I was like, somebody's picking this shit up. Mm hmm. So. Unless they don't want to be, I guess. Unless they out. don't want to be. Maybe they're mm-hmm. making good money on their YouTube videos and yeah. packages and stuff. I don't know. Or, you know, I look at it like if they could help more people, you know, like if going bigger helps them help more they people. Have, they have yeah. created a second team. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They've actually gotten other people to help them create new devices, new devices and drones and shit. Like That's other awesome. companies have come and chipped in Damn. to find these That's really cars. cool. That's such a great cause, too. It's just interesting. And they're solving these cases of people that have been missing for like 30 fucking years. Damn. Mm. I'm going to have to check it out. All right. Let's talk about Myra Statham before we have before we send you guys into the first installment. So I'll read you her author bio and then the book bio that you're going to hear. It's called Hard Part. Um, Myra Statham is a contemporary romance author. All her books to date can be read as standalones and do not have cliffhangers. On in her free time, she loves reading and hanging out with her family and friends. That's her quick little blurb about herself, which I love. Um, the book bio is um, Damien Benitez and Paz Alva blurred the lines of friendship with one passionate night. But instead of telling Paz how he felt, Damien shied away, afraid to give in to his dad's expectations, and he's regretted it ever since. When his dad dies unexpectedly, Damien returns to his hometown of Desert Rose, California. 
He's planning to stay and open a barber shop with his brother and cousins. He's he finally has something more to offer Paz than following him following him from army base to army base. He knows he has his work cut out for him and if she's going to give him a chance. But he doesn't mind. Anything worthwhile takes work. The hard part in life usually leads to the sweetest rewards and he's more than ready to lay his heart on the line. I think that's romantic. It's like um, watching a whole series. Yes. Like this is awesome. Like, I love she included all this on here. She said the ebook and paperback of the book you're about to listen to, Hard Part, both the ebook and paperback contain bonus material. This book kicks off the beginning of a new series. Hat Trick Barber Shop is the name of it. The next book in the series after this one is um, September 22nd and it's titled Clean Cut. Then High and Tight comes out October 13th and Taper Down October 27th. She's got like all these dates. I have like, all of I don't this know how in the show this. notes. Like I just She's clicked the whole series for you guys to be able to click in to see it all. Mm -hmm. awesome and then ready to go. The new one she has out though it's currently right now before this one is um, Stalked by the Quarterback that Mel was talking about earlier and Stalked by the Tight End. Tight End just released yesterday real time. So this is last week for you guys. And the series will continue early 2023 was stalked by the wide receiver and stalked by the coach. She said it was one of those books that was going to be a standalone and it kind of became a series because I couldn't help myself. Um, her giveaway this week is a signed copy of Hard Part and a $25 Amazon gift card. So make sure you go enter to win. That's it. Let's do it. Let's send you guys in. We'll see you on the other side. Bye. Hard Part. Hat Trick Barbers by Myra Statham. Read for you by Hector Carrillo. Blurb Damien Benitez and Paz Alva blurred the lines of friendship with one passionate night. But instead of telling Paz how he felt, Damien shied away, afraid to give in to his dad's expectations, and he's regretted it ever since. When his dad dies unexpectedly, Damien returns to his hometown of Desert Rose, California. He's planning to stay and open a barber shop with his brother and cousins. He finally has something more to offer Paz than following him from army base to army base. He knows he has his work cut out for him if she's going to give him a chance, but he doesn't mind. Anything worthwhile takes work. The hard parts in life usually lead to the sweetest rewards, and he's more than ready to lay his heart on the line. Prologue Damien Benitez I'm home. I smiled at the text as I slipped it back in my pocket. Who got you smiling like that? My cousin Santos' voice perked up and I could feel my brows bunching together. What? I asked, pretending I hadn't heard him in hopes to either find a way to change the subject or earn some extra time. You heard him? Sergio, my younger brother, chimed in, and suddenly I was seriously aware I had three sets of eyes on me. My brother and two of my cousins stared at me from over the bonfire we'd started in the backyard of our childhood home. Pass? I swallowed, knowing I was going to get shit from them. She's home, I shared. She'd just been over for dinner, but had to leave early since she had to work in the morning. She texted you she got home? Santos asked, and I turned my attention to him as he took a healthy drink from his beer bottle. Santos was the clean-cut one of the four of us. Where the rest of us were inked up and looked like the bad boys fathers warned their daughters about, he looked like the boy next door. Yeah, I confirmed. So I know she got home safe, I shared, and I watched as Santos' lips twitched slightly. You asked her to do this? Jesus, the guy was like a dog with a bone. She does it all the time. For the last, fuck, I didn't even know how long. I shrugged, trying to sweep the whole conversation under the rug. So what do you think about the barber shop? I think it's pretty important for you to change the subject. Sergio added, patting a grinning Chris on the shoulder. Hell yeah, man. So wait, how long have you and Paz... Me and Paz what? I cut him off. 
my face emotionless as I attempted to ignore the knot at my throat. You know what, man? Don't act brand new, Santos laughed. Paz and I... Fuck. We're just friends. The lie slipped past my lips easily. Something I'd had to tell them countless times over the years. So many times I'd almost grown to believe it as I had pushed away what I had felt for her. Until last year. I'd come home at Christmas time and suddenly I couldn't deny what I felt because shit had changed. The way I saw her, felt around her, the need to be around her, it was like I had seen her for the first time through a whole new set of eyes. Liar, a voice in the back of my head perked up. I'd always felt something for her, but the timing had never been right. It still wasn't. It was one of the reasons I avoided coming back to our small hometown of Desert Rose. Just friends? Santos repeated, and he shook his head. If you seriously believe that, you're even dumber than I thought you were. Look, me and her... My voice drifted off to nothing as I looked away from Santos. My eyes drifted to the fire in front of me. I didn't know how to explain what I felt for Paz without sounding like a complete idiot. Come on, man, Chris said, hitting my leg. We know you. Since forever, he shrugged. He'd known me his entire life. We were cousins, but had grown up closer than brothers. Chris and Santos had moved in with us after his parents had passed away in a car accident. The four of us had grown up like brothers. My parents never treated either of us any differently. You've known Damien your entire life, dumbass. All I'm saying is we know him, okay? Which means we've known Paz since forever, since they've been buddies, since what, kindergarten? Seventh grade. I corrected him and heard Santos try to hide his laughter with a cough. <coughs> Seventh grade? And your ass is what now? Thirty-one. Fuck, you're getting up there, Chris mumbled, and I flipped him the bird. Maybe it's time to shit or get off the pot. What's that supposed to mean? I frowned as I leaned forward. Chris was lucky there was a freaking fire pit between us. I think what my little brother is trying to say is, are you going to make a move or not? Because Paz is a catch, man. Some other guy's going to swoop in and you're going to lose your shot. My shot. I muttered before my jaw clenched. I knew they were right. It wasn't anything I hadn't thought of myself. Paz was single now after kicking her last boyfriend to the curb for being a liar. I knew a woman like Paz was one in a million. I don't live here, I reminded them. I'd joined the army right out of high school to spite my dad. I loved the old man, but we butted heads way too much. Santos was a year older than me, and I knew how much his college tuition was. I had no idea what I wanted to do with my life, so I'd enlisted. But I knew I was done serving my time. I wasn't going to re-enlist, and in less than three months, I would be back home living like a civilian. That's why we're opening the barber shop, right? Serge broke his own silence, and I stared at him. Sergio might have been three years younger than me, but he had a head for business. Come on, man. We all know you just left because Pops was on your ass about applying to work at the city, he said. And not knocking the job. What he did was great and put a roof over our heads and food on the table. But I get it. It wasn't for you. Now, we have the means and an idea and the money to do this. We open a barber shop in town together. We do shit we want on our terms. A barber shop, I repeated. The idea had started a couple of years ago, something we had just talked about while drinking in the same spot we were now. Our senior year of high school, my mom had insisted we all get our barber certificate, something to fall back on to earn honest money, she said. And for whatever reason, the four of us had kept it current. Sergio had just graduated from business school and had been on us to do this with him. Whatever. I don't see women fawning over any of you guys. I pointed and they laughed as I stood. 
Aw, don't get pissed. Don't go, Chris and Sergio called out. I'm not pissed. Just going to go for a walk, I muttered. To Paz's place? Santos laughed, and I waved at them, leaving through the back gate. Deep in my thoughts, with a little buzz still flowing through me, my feet had somehow led me to Paz's place. A small, little three-bedroom bungalow about four blocks from my parents' home. Someone else can swoop in, Chris's voice played in my head. I'd been thinking that same shit every day since I realized my feelings. I was in love with Paz Alva. I stared at the little house with the teal door and swallowed hard. What did I have to offer her? If I knocked on her door, I knew there was no way I would be able to stop myself from kissing her. Hell, it had been almost impossible not touching her while she'd been over having dinner with my family and I. I'd claim her and she was way too good for me. Smart and brilliant. Her best friend and her had slowly brought our little town of Desert Rose back to life through their real estate ventures. My hands clenched and relaxed at my side. I had to get the hell back home. If I didn't, I would fuck shit up. I'd go up there and kiss her, talk her into giving herself to me because I needed her more than I needed to breathe. Fuck, just standing outside her house had me obscenely hard. Then, suddenly the teal door I'd been staring at opened. There, shining brighter than the stars above my head, Baz appeared. Her eyes widened, surprised to see me. But when she smiled, obviously happy to see me, I knew it was too late. It was time to shoot my shot. Paz Alva I blinked once and then twice, trying to make out if he was really there. Hey! I stepped out of my house, down the two steps of my front porch, only stopping mere inches from him. What are you doing here? Did I? My voice died on my tongue when I caught the intensity of his dark gaze. What's wrong? I whispered, my hand moving on its own accord, touching the hard plane of his muscular chest. Is it your mom? Dad? The guys? What's wrong is you, he hissed. His response catching me completely off guard. Me? I almost dropped my hand from his chest, but his large, warm, calloused hand covered it. You, he repeated, and I watched as his dark gaze dropped to my lips. You and your perfect lips and eyes, he rasped. That's when I realized how heavily he was breathing, how tightly wound he was, like a beast about to pounce. Wait, what? I tried to process what he'd just said, but it wasn't computing. My lips? Eyes? These were only things I'd dreamt about him saying to me. I'd been in love with my best friend for so long. Mi vida. My life. The term of endearment slipped past his rough lips and my breathing stuttered to a halt. Damien. I wasn't even able to finish saying his name because suddenly it was like Damien was making each and every one of my fantasies and daydreams come true. His lips were on mine, kissing me like our lives depended on it. It only took me a second to react, and when I did, I stepped on the tips of my toes to wrap my hands in the back of his hair, pulling him closer. He groaned in my mouth and I swear my knees wobbled at the sensation. Almost as if sensing my distress, he swooped in and picked me up. My legs instinctively wrapped around his waist and there was no missing the hard length pressed against my very wet center. I could feel him moving, but I couldn't tear my lips from his. My hands held onto his shoulders, digging into their broadness. Damien. Fuck, he growled tearing his mouth off mine, just as the front door to my place was kicked shut. Our eyes connected. I'd known Damien Benitez for what felt like a lifetime and had been in love with him just as long, but had always been too scared to do anything about him. Being just friends made it a safe guarantee that he wouldn't leave my life. 
Tell me to put you down and to go home, Paz, he warned. It took me a moment to understand what he was saying. If I told him that, he would leave. He wouldn't cross any other lines. But wasn't it time to cross that and every other line? Damien, I whispered breathily, still trying to catch my breath. Buzz. His strong jaw clenched and my hands moved to relax it. Stay. I sealed my fate, biting the need to ask him to stay forever. Chapter 1 Damien One Month Later To the old man! My brother Sergio lifted his glass a little too roughly. The cheap scotch splashed out. Shit! He slurred, and I had to clear my throat in a weak attempt not to scoff or laugh at my little brother. Shit. We would seriously be paying for this shit show tomorrow. Al viejo! To the old man! I muttered. My two cousins' deep voices repeated the sentiment as we all took our shots and looked out at the bonfire roaring in front of us. Almost to the date a month ago, we'd been right here, drinking and hanging out, but now we were drinking for another reason. My dad had died. One moment I was on the phone with him, arguing about who knows what, and the next call I got was my mom telling me he was no longer with us. Just like that. In what felt like a blink of an eye. And to top it off, I couldn't remember a recent conversation when we hadn't been bickering with one another. Life was a bitch. He was a good man, my cousin Santos said, breaking the silence, and I looked at him. A year older than me, he had always thought my dad had hung the fucking moon. But I got it. My parents had taken him and Chris in when their own parents had passed away in a car accident. Being raised as brothers had been easy. I loved my cousins and brother, but being the oldest of four in a Mexican-American family hadn't been easy, especially when the old man and I had been too much alike. We really gonna do this? Santos asked, and I felt my lips twitch upward. Hell yeah, we are, Sergio cheered a little too loudly. I winced as I watched my little brother take another swig. I think Dad would have liked us doing this. To family, he toasted. His gaze was hooded and his body swayed a little too much. Family, we all repeated, and I reached over and took the bottle from him. Getting drunk was one thing. Drinking so much we needed to take him to get his stomach pumped was a whole other. You've been quiet, Christian remarked, and I felt three sets of eyes on me. I'm fine. You don't sound happy. Sergio swayed closer, and I reached out to stop him from falling. Jesus, he had always been a lightweight. I mean, not happy happy. None of us can be right now with Dad, but you know what I mean. He was close to falling off the chair, and I pushed him back on. I'm happy, man. I patted his back, and he nodded with a cheesy grin as he sat back and got comfortable. I glanced over and met Santos's gaze. Out of the four of us, Santos and I were the closest. Maybe due to our age or both of us being the oldest. Whatever it was, we were tight. The last time I had been around the fire, I had too much to drink. Liar. I'd been buzzed, but I'd known exactly what I'd done when I had found my way in front of the small bungalow with a teal door. Maybe a little lust drunk when I'd kissed my best friend, but in the light of a new day, I'd been stone-cold sober. I'd known what life would be like, and I was excited for it. Until I got home and my dad started in on me. He'd somehow guessed I'd been with Paz and he was all but ready to order the wedding invitations. He'd gotten my head and I'd fucked up. Not wanting to live my life the way he'd wanted me to. Pride. Too stupid and pig-headed to see straight. I'd fucked up my chance. A month since I hadn't spoken to Paz had gone in a blink of an eye, and fuck that killed. Especially now my dad was gone. I was clear-minded enough to know I had to do something, and soon, or else regret would become my middle name. 
It was too late to mend shit with my dad. But maybe, just maybe, it wasn't too late to fix things with Paz. Everything about that night was fresh in my head. The way I'd taken her, got lost in her body right in her living room floor. I rubbed the spot over my heart at the memory of her. Any time Paz Alva crossed my mind, an ache grew. Not just lust, but a literal yearning. I missed her. I'd fucked everything up a month ago. Chris strummed his acoustic guitar and Sergio started to sing some old song. One of my dad's favorites. After laying my dad to rest today, we deserve to burn off some steam. You really okay, man? Santos asked as he scooted a little closer, his voice soft enough for it to be for my ears only. About hat-trick barbers? Of course, I shrugged. I don't know about the name, but... It's good. Hat-trick, you know? We're all taking our shot. He reminded me, and I stared at him seriously. A hat-trick makes three goals. It's four of us, Santi. I pointed, and Santos coughed his laughter away. It's going to work, he assured me, but all I did was roll my eyes. Whatever, I muttered. I'm excited about it, I answered honestly. What about moving back to Desert Rose? I was coming home. Fuck. Desert Rose? I mumbled. It's home, right? I shrugged, taking a healthy swig. Wishing I would have sprung for something a little more expensive before handing the bottle of scotch to him. Home, he repeated as he took his own drink. You know who I saw at the funeral today? The whole fucking town was there, I said under my breath. My dad had been a popular guy. We might have had our issues, but I knew my pops had been a good man. That had been evident with the number of people who had showed up to be there for my mom as we had laid him to rest. My mom. I swallowed hard as I watched the fire. Her grief was a palpable being. Not that she thought we could see it. She'd been fighting tooth and nail, trying so hard not to be sad around her boys. Baz? Her name had me sitting up as I met my cousin's gaze. Santos' hand patted my back. Yeah, that's what I thought, he muttered, and I scowled. Excuse me? I asked defensively. Nothing, man. Santo shook his head. His inked fingers grabbed the bottle again and took another drink. What happened last month? Shut up, Santos. I warned, but we'd been drinking too much. Nothing. Nothing, huh? Okay. She was looking good today. You mind if... I'd never hit my brothers or cousins. Not once. We'd roughhoused as kids or wrestled, but I'd never struck one. Between the long week, exhaustion due to lack of sleep, and tidal wave of emotions, not to mention the alcohol in my blood, I grabbed at his shirt and lifted my other hand up, ready to smash it into his smug face when the asshole started to laugh. He coughed before patting my face with his hands. I knew it, man. He shook his head as I dropped my hands and I breathed in through my nose. Baz is off limits, I growled as I stood, my hands in tight fists. Chris stopped playing his guitar and I knew they were all staring at me, probably thinking I had lost my fucking mind and who could blame them? I had. Baz had always done things to my head, but it was worse now. You know she's... I pointed at him and jerked my head. I don't want to hear it, I gritted through my teeth. He had no clue, not one, just how badly I'd screwed up with Paz. Fuck. I rubbed my face and tried to relax my shoulders. I'm gonna go for a walk. Don't burn the house down, I muttered as I turned and left through the back gate of my childhood home. I walked, trying to push away the thoughts swimming in my head. It wasn't until I stood in front of the house with the teal door that I realized where I'd gone to. I stood there and thought about the woman inside. How she had given herself to me. Freely. Completely. And I'd let my damn pride and need to do the opposite of what my pops wanted. 
As I stood there, I knew I had to figure out a way to get back on her good graces. To win her back. And fuck if that wasn't the hard part. Chapter 2 Paz I looked around and smiled. I knew in my gut this was the right place for the Benitez boys. The foot traffic in this area of Desert Rose was amazing and completely underrated. I was positive this would be the next area in the city to flourish. Perfect for the barbershop they wanted to open. I'd grown up with the Benitez boys. Well, men now. Always at their home, all through high school, having been tight as thieves with my best friend Damien. Stop torturing yourself, I chastised myself. I closed my eyes and breathed in deep, trying to brush away the tinge of sadness I felt when I thought about Damien. Sergio, Santos, and Christian had always been sweet. Like brothers I'd never had, but totally appreciated, since I'd grown up in a household of nothing but women. But Damien... Damien had been everything to me. And for one night, I'd really believed he'd be mine. Paz. As if I'd conjured him up by thought, I heard his voice and my body knew it. I didn't have to turn to know it was him. I'd done a great job avoiding bumping into him. Not good enough, obviously. I stood my full height of five foot nothing before turning on my heels and looked right at the man who had always owned my heart. Damien Benitez. The jerk had no right to look even better than the last time I'd seen him. What are you doing here? His beautiful face scowled and I tried to school my face, not showing him how his harsh words had affected me. Hello to you too, Damien, I murmured, crossing my arms over my chest in need to put as many obstacles between us as possible. Where's Santos? Busy, he mumbled as his jaw clenched. They sent me. Wait, shouldn't it be one of them since it's their shop? It's our shop, he corrected, and I felt the color drain from my face. Damien was going to be running the shop, too? He was staying in Desert Rose? Okay, then, I quickly recovered, thankful I was far away enough not to soak in the heady masculine scent of his cologne. Damien always smelled too good for his own good. I wanted you to check this spot out because... Look, let's not waste time. He cut me off coldly. We're going with the one off Lime and Buenaventure. He clipped and I tried not to react to his rudeness. I know you guys like that place. It's a great location. But like I told Santos in my email, if you would look at... I had started to bring out the file containing the numbers and projections I had worked all week on. But he didn't reach for them. Instead, he crossed his big, stupid arms in front of him directing my eyes to his bulging biceps. Ink peeked through one sleeve, and I had to shake my head to urge myself to focus. Thanks, but I'm sure you could email that to Santos as well. Like I said, we like... I heard you. I cut him off this time. I was over being professional and patient. If Damien could act like a huge asshole, I could be a roaring bitch. Thank you for wasting my time. I clipped. I turned to pass him. But I had been too slow, and he was a lot faster than I had ever given him credit for. His hand touched my hip and pulled me in right in front of him. My brows bunched, but before I could ask what he thought he was doing, his face dipped down and I froze. His lips crashed against mine, and my mind blanked as my heart took over my body. Instead of pushing him away, I found myself kissing him back. Desperately. Like my body needed him and had yearned for his mouth on mine since he'd left my bed six weeks ago. With every kiss and swipe of his tongue against mine, my mind blurred and anger faded. My hands found the back of his head as he deepened the kiss. He controlled the moment as if I belonged to him. But like last time, buyer's remorse must have hit. He ended the kiss abruptly and stepped away, putting plenty of space between us. I pried my eyes open, fighting to catch my breath, only to find him standing less than a foot away. Baz. 
Something about listening to my name roll off his lips so easily after six weeks of radio silence from him came over me. My hand had a mind of its own, and I reacted without thinking. It rose, and I slapped Damien Benitez right on his stupid, beautiful face. His gaze never wavered as his hand soothed his cheek. I deserved that. His voice was gruff. I swallowed, hating and loving that I could still taste him. Yes, you do. I cannot believe you, I exclaimed, fighting the overwhelming urge to stomp my feet like a toddler. I felt too sensitive. Every nerve ending from the top of my head to the soles of my feet felt exposed, raw. I'd only ever once felt that way in my life, and that had been with the very man I'd just slapped. All right, lady listeners, <laughs> thank you so much um, for hanging out with us for part one. Be sure and join us back here on Thursday's episode uh, for part two of Hard Part by Myra Statham. Until then, make sure you enter this week's giveaway and check out the show notes for the links to everything we talked about. Fuck your day up. Make today your bitch. Don't be a dick. Bye, guys. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. Read me romance. Read, read me romance. You could take a look in a book that's fine, or you could sit back, relax, and unwind and read me romance. Read, read me romance.